Greg will be pleased that I still wear a tie. Did you see that? That was pretty good. Making sure that you saw it. Thanks, uh, thanks to the music team. That was fantastic. And uh, Stanley on the drums. Thank you, Stanley, for keeping us in beat there. And uh, it's great to see Stanley's got a couple of friends here with him this morning. Uh, Mario, one of his good mates from way back in Kenya days. And Carly, who's just sitting next to Stanley there. The Lord used her incredibly to bring um, Stanley to the Lord, right? And so Carly's been living in Kenya for about eight years and uh, doing an awesome job over there. So welcome, guys. It's great to have you here. And uh, maybe one day the Lord will give us the opportunity to go visit you guys in Kenya one day. Uh, but uh, it's great to, great to have you here this morning just uh, worshiping with us. Well, we are continuing in our study on the attributes of God. And essentially, as we've been doing this, we've been just asking a very simple question. What is God like? What is God like? You know, sadly, a lot of people tend to downsize God in their thinking. It's almost like they want to sweep him under the carpet or they, they want to just put him, refine him to a little box. But I think we all understand that that's the wrong way to think about God. We need, we need to think differently. We need to remind ourselves, even as Benji has this morning, that God is bigger, that God is greater, that God is loftier than anything that we can imagine. We need to have a high and an exalted view of God. And we've already seen in this series that God is he's not only holy, but he's holy, holy, holy. And we've seen that he's not only powerful, but he is all-powerful. And we've seen that God is not only knowing, but that he is all-knowing. He knows all things. He has all power. He's holy in all of his ways. And this morning, we're going to remind ourselves that God is everywhere, as you can see. God is everywhere. And to say that God is everywhere is to say that he is omnipresent. Omni is just a word that means all or every, and present, you understand understand that, it's close by or, or next to. And so therefore we can say that God is next to everything. He is present everywhere. Now this is kind of hard for our finite minds to grasp. It's, it's a little bit hard for us to, to comprehend. But the biblical evidence is everywhere for the fact that God is everywhere. Although even having said that, there are a few verses in Scripture that seem to suggest, even as we read them, that God is only in one location. Maybe you can think of some of those off the top of your head. You think of the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in where? heaven, right? And so the question is, is he only in heaven or is he broader than that? Is he outside of heaven as well? You might be able to think of uh, a verse in Hebrews 1 verse 3 which talks about the Son, talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus sat down, where? At the right hand of the majesty on high. So as we think about that, is Jesus only in heaven? Or maybe there's some verses about the Holy Spirit and, and we know that the, the church is called God's temple and that God's temple is the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So when we think about that, does that mean that the Holy Spirit is only in the church, or is he in other places as well? And then you can think of some other verses. Ephesians 4 verse 6 says that God, our Father, is above all and through all and in you all, it says. I'm sure you're familiar with Matthew 18, the verse which speaks about Jesus that says, wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there is Jesus in their midst. And we know that the Holy Spirit, as we've seen in recent months, He indwells us. As Christians, He indwells us. And so as we look at Scripture, we see that God's presence is in heaven, His presence is on earth, it's in the church, and it's in every believer. And now those verses that did seem to portray God as just being in one location, they're designed to help us just understand the the relational aspect of God's character. He is where we are. He is in that location. And sometimes Scripture speaks about him just being in that one location. But in essence, the, the wider picture of Scripture says that God is everywhere. And I think we understand that God is invisible. He's invisible, but that certainly does not mean that he is not here. He is. He is everywhere. 
you know, we can't see radio frequencies and that kind of thing, can we? But we know they exist. And in the same way, we can't see God, but we know He exists. And then the Bible says that God is spirit. He's spirit. He is spiritual. He is immaterial. Therefore, we cannot detect Him with our eyes, but we know that He is present in all places. And because He is spirit, He is able to be everywhere. He's able to be in front of us and behind us and beside of us. And as we think about that, this doctrine has huge implications for our lives. And we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through this morning. Now we do realize too, and I'm sure you've been thinking about this, is that God did choose to reveal himself. He did choose to become visible, but in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in essence, God is not flesh and bone. He is spirit. So to say that God is omnipresent is to realize that he is everywhere. And not only to realize that he is everywhere, but it is to realize this, that he sees everything. He sees everything. Nothing escapes from the view of God. Nothing can obstruct his vision because he is at all times everywhere and therefore is able to see everything. He has no blind spots at all. You know, sometimes us men, you know, it's like you ladies, right? We have men's eyes and we can't see some things, usually the things right in front of us. But God's not like that. He has no blind spots. He sees everything because he is everywhere and can see it. Let me just point out a couple of verses to begin with. We're going to go to Psalm 139 later on. But if you want to turn to Jeremiah 23, just to pull out a couple of verses from the Old Testament that will just set these thoughts in our mind this morning as we think about God's omnipresence. Jeremiah 23 and verse 23 it's going to be. But this is a passage that speaks about false prophets. It speaks about false prophets and priests. And they had been committing adultery, these false prophets. They were wicked. They were polluted. They had been leading people astray. They were liars. They were proclaiming to have visions from God, but they hadn't. And they were prophesying that there was going to be peace, but in reality there was going to be calamity But because they were false prophets. And God was really angry with them, and he was going to judge them. And this is the passage in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. It says this. God says, Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord? And not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? And he says this, Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? What a statement. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? And so there it is. God is saying that he he is everywhere. He's in the heavens and he's on the earth. And for that very reason, nobody can hide from God because he fills it all. He's everywhere. Every corner of heaven and every corner of earth is occupied by God. And God was reminding those false prophets of that truth. They forgot that God was everywhere. They thought, actually, that they could hide from him. But God saw their ways, and he heard their false prophecies and reminded them that he was everywhere. Another verse you might want to flick to is in... First Kings, we haven't been there very often before, First Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. It's a passage that speaks uh, or involves Solomon. Remember when uh, Solomon was building that magnificent, beautiful temple? And Solomon prayed a, a prayer of thanksgiving. And the temple, as you know, was symbolically considered to be the place where God lived. It was the place where God dwelt. And then Solomon said in 1 Kings 8 and verse 27, he said, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. And so Solomon was reminding us again that God is everywhere. He cannot be limited to any confined space. I mean, even though the temple was built and it was constructed to represent the presence of God, we know that it could never contain his full presence at all. And as I said before, he's not God's not just in heaven. He's not just in your heart. He's not just in the church. He's not just in that Old Testament temple. God is everywhere. Everywhere. He's in New Zealand.
Zealand. He's in Napier. He's in Onikawa. God, at this very moment, is present in this room. He's everywhere. Everywhere. And while He is present with us, He is watching us and He is listening to us. Is it Acts 17 that says that God is not far from each of us? Because He's right there. He's in this room. And so we need to remind ourselves continually that God is wherever we are. And we cannot escape from His presence. We cannot run from Him. So take your Bibles again and just flick over to Psalm 139. We were in this passage last Sunday as we were examining God's omniscience, the fact that God knows everything. And so we saw some important truths from that passage last time. God knows everything about you. He knows when you get up. He knows when you go to bed. He knows your thoughts. He knows your motivations. He knows why you do things. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows the words that are on your lips that you're going to speak during the rest of today and even the rest of your life. And so God's knowledge is what we see in Psalm 139, the first six verses. And quite often his presence and his knowledge go hand in hand together. And that's what we see here in Psalm 139. The psalmist is... David, we know him well. And I don't think there's any clearer, any clearer passage in Scripture that talks about the omnipresence of God than this passage here in Psalm 139 and starting in verse 7. And David asks a very simple question. Let me read from verse 7 down to verse 12. David says this, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven... You are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. So David asks a very interesting question, doesn't he, in verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I go? Where shall I flee from your presence? You might ask yourself, well, why does David ask that question? He's not asking it because he wants to avoid God. I don't think he really wants to do that. But I think David is trying to remind himself of this wonderful truth of God's omnipresence. That's a good question that we could ask ourselves as well. Ask yourself, where can I go from God's Spirit? Where can I go to get away from God's presence? And the answer is simple, isn't it? You can't go anywhere. There's nowhere, nowhere where you can go. When you are home alone, you are not home alone. God is there. Whether you like it or not, God is right beside you everywhere go. You know, an atheist might ask the question, well, where is God? But the Christian would respond, where is he not? Where is he not? He's everywhere. And this doctrine, this doctrine of the omnipresence of God is, is a really practical doctrine. It should make it difficult for us to sin. This is, I would say, the sin killing doctrine because God sees you everywhere you go he, he knows what you're up to he sees everything you do he sees the books you read he sees the, the videos you watch he sees the websites you access he's watching your behavior in your relationships he sees everything that your parents don't see you know what we You know, we, we usually prefer to sin when our parents aren't watching. We usually prefer to sin when our friends aren't watching or our family because it's embarrassing if we get caught. You know, my friend Scott Adivanis once, Adivanis once said this. He said, what sin do you commit in the face of God that you would never dream of committing in front of your friends and family? 
every time you sin, it's as if you have ascended up into the clouds and you've entered into the throne room of God and you've walked right up to the very face of God and you've committed that sin right in front of Him. That's what it's like every time you sin. Because it happens right in the presence of God. Psalm 90 verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Don't fool yourself. God sees everything that you do. We need to remind ourselves that our life is an open book before God. He is, as it were, the permanent spectator of your life. So David's asking this question, where, where can I go from God's presence? Where? And the answer is obvious. You can't go anywhere. And I want you to just to notice here what David says in the psalm. We're going to answer the question, where, where is God's presence? Where is he presently located? Let me give you a few points from this psalm. God's presence is in the highest place. It's in the highest place. David says there in verse 8, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. You know what? You can go as high as you like, but you cannot escape God. You could ride the highest elevator. You could climb the highest mountain. You could build the Tower of Babel, which I think the kids are looking at this morning. You can take a helicopter ride. You could take a plane ride, a space shuttle, whatever. You could go to the moon. You could go to Mars, wherever. You can go as high as you want, but you will always find God there. You cannot hide from Him. If I get to the highest of the heavens, David says, God is there. What was that verse we read in 1 Kings 8? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. So God's presence is in the highest place, David tells us in Psalm 139. He also tells us that God's presence is in the lowest place in verse 8. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So you could go to the lowest place, but you're going to find God there also at the, bo- at the bottom of the deepest coal mine. God is there. You could go to the bottom of the Dead Sea, which is like apparently the, the lowest place on earth. If you went there, God is still there. You could go to Sheol, to the depths, to the, to the place of the dead, to the grave, and God is still there because God not only resides in the highest place, but God resides in the lowest place. Which sometimes begs the question, some people will ask, well, is, if God's everywhere... Is God even in hell? Is he there as well? A couple of verses to think about in regard to that is is one in or second Thessalonians chapter one verses seven to nine. I'll just read those to you. It says there, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And then it says this, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. So as you read that verse, it seems to indicate that God's presence is not in hell, the place of eternal destruction. But then you've got to weigh that up with the verse in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 10, which says this, If anyone worships the beast, He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels. And it says, and in the presence of the Lamb. So this verse seems to indicate that the place of judgment is a place where Christ, the Lamb, is present. And so it seems to indicate that the Lamb, that God's presence is in hell. Now, the way to understand this is that there's two different words that are used in the original which have slightly different meanings. I mean, we translate them the word presence in English, but they have slightly different meanings in the original language. In that verse I just read you in Revelation 14, when it talks about in the presence of the Lamb, it is almost like saying in the sight of the Lamb. It's like it's a a measurable distance. It's something that you can measure. 
And, and so God sees everything. Christ the Lamb sees everything in hell because he's there. That verse is saying that he is definitely there. But when you go back to the other verse in Second Thessalonians, it's not so much that it's talking about a measurable distance that, that God is not there, but it's talking about the fact that God's not there with his blessing. He's not there with his fellowship. You are away from God's presence in the sense you're away from God's blessing and God's um, fellowship in hell. And that is definitely true, isn't it? And so I would say, yes, God is in hell, but he's there not with his attributes of love and kindness. He's there uh, solely with his attribute of wrath and judgment and punishment in that place. And by the way, God's presence in hell does not violate his character. It doesn't taint his character just because he's present there it, and just because it's one of the, well, the most despicable place in the universe. It does not defile him. God can be there and still be holy and righteous and just. Some people say that he's not in hell because it defiles his character, but I don't believe that. So God's presence is everywhere. It's in the highest heavens. It's in the lowest places. The psalmist tells us also in verse 9 in the psalm that God's presence is, is, is in, the, in the widest place, or maybe we could say in the furthest place. Verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea. In Israel, the, the sun comes up over the, the eastern mountain. I guess you saw a sunrise in Israel just not long ago, Ben and Faith and Jen um, at Stan's Day were over there. But the sun comes up over the eastern mountains. If you can picture it on a map, you know, you've got Israel here and then you've got the, the Mediterranean Sea out to the west. And then there's like all of the eastern mountains that are on the, the right-hand side of Israel there, the eastern side. The sun comes up over those eastern mountains and the, the rays burst across Israel and right across the Mediterranean Sea out as far as you can see. And maybe David is saying here, it's not exactly clear what he's saying when he talks about if I take the wings of the morning. Maybe he is saying this, that God's presence is from that east where the sun comes up all the way to the west where that sunshine just bursts across the land and across the waters. And you can't measure it. It's, it's just so far and it's so wide. And so God's presence is in all of those places as far away as you can see. And some people seem to think that it could also be meaning this, that as, as fast as the sun comes up and those rays travel from the east right across to the west, uh, you know, God's kind of like traveling that fast. You can't escape him because it's moving so quickly. But the bottom line is, is that the, the psalmist is saying here, you know, God's presence is everywhere. It's, it's as wide as you can think, as far away as you can think. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea. Verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. So we can't escape that. We can't escape the hand of God. At the far end of the sea, if you could ever get there, God is still there. You know, a lot of people fall into difficult times in this life. They go through a lot of troubles, and they try to run away from their problems. They try to escape their troubles. Sometimes they'll flee to another region. Sometimes they'll flee to another country. They'll try and get away and isolate themselves. Maybe sometimes they'll get away because they've done something wrong and they, they don't want to get caught, and so they, they flee, they run away. Maybe there's some kind of breakdown, some kind of family breakdown, and they take off. You know, it doesn't matter where you go, where you take off. You cannot escape from God. You cannot run from the omnipresent God. If you go to Australia, he's there. Go to America, he's there. Go to Timbuktu, which is in Australia, he's there too. You could go to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and he's there. Even if no one else is there, God is still there. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. And then David draws our attention to one other aspect in this psalm. He says that God's presence is in the darkest places, the darkest places, verse 11 and 12. The psalmist says this, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. It's interesting, isn't it? God does not need the lights on 
see what God is doing. He doesn't. Darkness is no barrier to God. He has the perfect night vision. And, and of course he has the perfect night vision because he created light and he created the dark. So neither of them provide any barrier to his vision. He sees clearly in the daytime and he sees just as clearly in the night. And so the things that we do in the dark, God can see just as clearly as those things that we do in the broad daylight. God is intimately acquainted with every little detail of our lives, and he's also acquainted with every little detail that takes place in the dark places in life in this world. And David gives a a really awesome illustration of this in verses 13 to 16. Maybe you could think of it this way. This is like almost the, in a sense, the darkest place where anybody could go. And you've all been there. Verse 13. You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Notice what verse 15 says. My frame was not hidden from you. God sees you there. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So here we are in this picture. We're in the midst of probably the most secure, perhaps the safest, in some ways the most isolated place that we have ever been in our mother's womb. And even there, God's there. God's seeing what is going on. And not only is he seeing what is going on, he's creating what is happening. There's nobody else around. Uh, unless you're a twin or a triplet, I guess. But there's really nobody else around. He sees us in there. He's putting us together. Verse 15, as I pointed out, we, are, or we were not hidden from God. He saw our unformed body. You know, even when we were in our mother's womb, we could not escape the presence of God. We could not escape the all-seeing eye of God. And now that we're all born, we can not escape God's presence. We still cannot escape it. He's here. He's at our home. He's in our bedrooms. He's in our classrooms. He sits in front of our TVs as we do. He sits in front of our computers, our books. He's there all of the time. And as I said before, just as those radio waves and frequencies are going all around our planet at the moment, we can't see them. We know they're there. Well, the same thing with God. We can't always see Him because He's Spirit, but we know He is there and He's watching every single move. Every single move. And like I said, this is a, this is a very practical doctrine. The doctrine of the omnipresence of God could change your life. I can remember when I first heard a guy preach on the subject. I can remember walking out of that session almost shaking in my boots, just being confronted with the presence of God. It's an incredible truth. It's a wonderful doctrine. I keep pumping it into your minds that theology is practical, and this is a theologically practical truth. All doctrine is practical. I've already alluded to it a few times. If you're a Christian this morning, this doctrine ought to have a purifying effect in your life. A little catchphrase that we used to say a number of years ago is that we should practice the presence of God. And and all that means is that we just need to remind ourselves that God is with us everywhere we are, watching us, seeing us. You know, I think we, we pretty much all understand that, right? We realize that He's everywhere. But do we really live like that? Do we live like that? You know, it's important to remind ourselves regularly of God's omnipresence. And let's not forget that it, it's God who is our ultimate judge. It's God who's our ultimate judge. You know, I said before that we want to try and hide our sin from our parents and our friends and whatever. But you know what? Our parents aren't going to be our ultimate judge. Our friends aren't going to be the ultimate judge of our lives. God is the ultimate judge of our lives. So what we do in the face of God is more important 
than what we do in front of anybody else. Whenever we sin, whether it be in our thoughts, whether it be in our words, whether it be in our actions, we do it in the presence of God. Every time. So God's omnipresence ought to be a wonderful spiritual medicine for us. It should help us to pour cold water on all of those temptations that we face daily to sin. But you know, I don't just want to camp on this as being a purifying doctrine. This is more than a purifying doctrine. This is a wonderful, comforting doctrine for Christians. When you are in great danger, when you're going through a major trial, it is hugely comforting to know that God is with us. Somebody once said, in every place we meet a friend, a protector, and a father. How transporting the thought, obviously it's an old guy with a quote who's writing it like that, how transporting the thought that we cannot go where God is not. So this is a great encouragement. It ought to be for a Christian that God is with us wherever we go. You know, I was thinking of that that great truth that is represented in that footprints plaque, you know, that one that you've got hanging on your wall or had hanging on your wall and put down that has been in most Christian families' homes over the last few years. You know, when it feels like I'm the only one there, when it seems like God has deserted me, when, when it feels like I'm all alone, we don't need to fear, we don't need to panic because God is always there. He is. Now, He may be carrying us, which is what the footprints plaque represents, but He's there, even if we don't realize it. He doesn't leave us. God promises in Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. He said, Jesus said to his followers, he says, I am with you always in that context to give you strength to be able to fulfill the great commission as you share Christ and share the gospel with others. But Christ is with us always. God will never leave us. During our temptations, God is there not to judge us per se, but to help us overcome them. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, God is faithful that whenever we're tested, whenever we go through a trial, He's providing a way of escape so that we can get out of it. So He's there to help us. His presence is is good for us. He's helping us escape that temptation so that we can walk the pathway of righteousness and not chase after evil. Even in the, the trial of death, the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. God's with us, even in those deepest, darkest times when we struggle with the loss of a loved one. If you're in your sick bed at home, whether you're in a hospital bed, whether you're living alone, God is always with you, and it's a doctrine of great comfort and encouragement. I remember watching a news TV news item many years back now. It was about this 92-year-old Christian lady and she was getting into her car after shopping and, and a man jumped into the passenger seat beside her and he had a gun. He said he had a gun and that he would use it if she didn't hand over to him all of her money. And she said, no. <laughs> She's 92 years old, right? No. And then she said this. She said, Jesus is in this car and he goes everywhere I go. And the guy looks into the back seat So, you know, he got really convicted of his sin at that moment and tears welled up in his eyes and he had this really short conversation with the lady. He gave her a quick kiss and took off. So here's this 92-year-old lady who trusted in God, who understood the omnipresence of God and it gave her boldness to do what she did. Incredible comfort, this doctrine. The Lord is near, Philippians 4, verses 5 and 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. So it's a comforting doctrine. It ought to comfort you. It's practical in the sense too that you can worship God anywhere. Because God is everywhere, you can worship God anywhere. Acts 17 verse 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands. And so we can worship God anywhere, wherever you are, is an opportunity to worship. You don't have to come here to do that. You can do it at the beach, at the forest, up Tomata Peak, in the paddocks, in a plane, in the kitchen, at the gym. Wherever you are, you can worship God. That's the, that's the reality of this doctrine. It's so practical. You can worship Him. You can sing to Him, praise Him. You can pray to Him anytime, anywhere, because He's right there. He sees you. He hears you, and remember from last week, He knows what you're going to say anyway, before you even say it. 
And I think a true understanding of the presence of God also helps your prayer to be more real. If you notice what David says at the end of the psalm, he says, Search my heart, O God. Now, David wasn't playing games with God. He wasn't playing around. He understood God's presence and the implications of that. He understood that God knew the very depth of his heart. He understood that God knew everything about him. So he opened and says, Lord, search my heart. And to see if there be any wicked way in me. David wanted his heart right with God. So as we understand the presence of God, that should be our response, that we would want to make sure that our heart is right with God because he knows it. He knows it. You can't play games with God. He knows your heart. Maybe someone here this morning is not a follower of Christ, not yet anyway. And this doctrine is relevant for you too because God is everywhere. And as I've alluded to already in this message, you can't escape God. You can't run from God. You might be able to avoid Christians. You might be able to despise church. You might be able to avoid the Bible. You can choose to ignore God, but you can never escape God's presence. God is everywhere. Hebrews 4, 13 says, There is no creature, there is no one on this planet, no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Every single one of us, believer and unbeliever, are going to have to stand before God one day. Unbelievers are going to have to stand before God and give an account for the way that they have lived their lives because God is your great judge. He is the creator. You are the creation and you must give an account for how you have lived. So if you don't yet know God personally, my encouragement would be that you turn your life to him and follow him and serve him and worship him and live for Christ. Follow him. Become a Christian. Don't reject God. Live for him and love him. So we ought to remind ourselves regularly that we have this permanent spectator in our life. He's watching us. He's there with us. He's helping us. He's encouraging us. He is, ev- he is wherever I am. God does not move in me, but I move in him. And that's it. So I pray that the om- omnipresence of God would change our hearts, would change our lives, that it would encourage us and help us to live lives, faithful lives, serving Him and loving Him. Let's pray. Father, even as we have our heads and hearts bowed this morning, I pray that these truths would resonate in our minds, in our hearts. Lord, I pray that it would convict us deeply where we need convicting. I pray that it would challenge us where we need challenging. Lord, I pray that it would comfort us where we need comforting. I pray that it would encourage us where we need encouraging. Lord, your word is precious. Theology is awesome because it's all about you and who you are. So Lord, help us to understand these truths and I pray that they would impact us deeply for your glory and so that we would be able to live